I'm on. Uh, welcome to this session on governance. We have been, all of us on this side of the table have been suitably instructed that time is extremely important. So before we go ahead, let me introduce to you our very distinguished speakers and discussants. We have two papers. Uh, the first paper is joint enterprise of Kartik Murlidharan and Sandeep Suktankar. Kartik is an assistant professor of economics at the UC San Diego. I think there are, there's plenty more about him that is here and a lot of you will hear more about it. But his interests develop are education, health and social protection, measuring quality of public service delivery, program evaluation. Sandeep is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Dartmouth College and he has received his PhD from Harvard University and his research focuses on the most topical corruption, governance and the delivery of public benefits and services in India. Lakshmi to my left is an associate professor at the Harvard Business School. Her primary research fields are political economy and development economics. She holds a PhD in economics from MIT. We have two very distinguished discussants. Uh, Mr. Jayant Sinha, who is a member of parliament elected to the Lok Sabha from Hazaribagh, and his affiliation is to the Bharatiya Janata Party. And he has over 25 years of experience as an investor and a strategy consultant. And most recently, he has worked with an investment firm. He has an MBA with distinction from the Harvard Business School, an MS in Energy Management and Policy, and from the U University of Pennsylvania, and a Bachelor of Technology degree with distinction from the IIT Delhi. So I don't think we need, we need more of you on <laughs> both sides of this room. Um, Santosh Matthew, my colleague, whom for whom I don't need an introduction, but let me introduce all of you to him. He's presently working as Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Rural Development. Before this, he was Principal Secretary, Rural Development Department, Government of Bihar. He belongs to the Indian Administrative Service of the 1986 batch, but nevertheless holds a PhD in governance from the IDS Sussex. I say nevertheless because both of us belong, have a label which carries both good things and bad things attached to it. So, uh, but both of us, I think, will justifiably claim that we know this side, the insides of the government and governance, the good and the bad, pretty well. So without much ado, the division of time is 40 minutes for the presentation of the paper, 10 minutes per discussant after each paper, and thereafter we will have the floor open for questions, answers, comments. So we look forward to a very energetic interaction. May I ask Karthik and Sandeep to begin? Thank you. Uh, is this on? Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. And this guy is working. Uh, is this signal worked off? Perfect. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks so much to the IGC uh, for providing this wonderful platform for disseminating work we've been doing now for the past four or five years. And it's almost the perfect uh, project to showcase to a panel of researchers and policymakers. And so without further ado, uh, we're especially grateful that Jayant uh, Sinha is here because in his previous life as the India head of Omidyar Network, they were the group that financially supported uh, this entire project. Uh, and so uh, and a special thank you and shout out. Over here. Um, so what is this, uh, this talk is about? Um, we, we're, we're talking in, uh, about building state capacity uh, in governance with a specific example of biometric smart cards. So I think everybody in India knows this point that anti-poverty programs are miserably implemented um, and estimates of leakage range from some programs 40 to 70 to 80 um, percent. So Land Pritchard has famously called India a flailing state. So we, you know, Pakistan is often called a failing state, but the flailing state is defined as the one where 
you have a brilliant head, but the head is not connected to the limbs because you have the most wonderful policies made, like I mean by the most brilliant policy makers at the center, um, but kind of translating that into implementation turns out to be highly non-trivial. And so, I mean, trying to improve governance and the performance of these programs is especially critical in the context of an expanding welfare state. So, um, India is kind of this historical outlier, right, that has democratized before being developed. And so, it's kind of almost a natural corollary of a median voter theorem in a country where your average voter is pretty close to the poverty line, that you will have much more redistribution than countries had at comparable levels of development. So, given that kind of structural aspect of the Indian economy, it becomes especially important um, to think about improving the effectiveness of governance because the political pressures are always going to be towards spending more in redistribution relative to public goods. So, and that kind of presages my next point, which is governments, of course, tend to focus much more on programs uh, rather than on state capacity for implementation. Um, and the most basic reason for this is patronage, because it's easier to target programs to your specific voters as opposed to general public goods or even general implementation capacity, which is kind of much more spread out. And it's kind of ama uh, amazingly appropriate that Mr. Matthew is here because his entire dissertation, uh, Matthew and Moore, which is cited here, was about how political um, the underinvestment in state capacity is often a deliberate political choice, uh, which in turn enhances the power of the policymakers or the politicians to allocate their restricted public goods towards their um, towards their favorite supporters. But I think there's even like a much more mundane reason, even without patronage. So the state, I'll just get to that in just a second, right? Mm. So, because there's a Besley person on formal definition, but so, and there's, there's, I think we actually couldn't find a site for this, right? But talking to people, you definitely get a sense that there's a perception that investing in state capacity has a long-term return on investment that's beyond the electoral cycle as opposed to specific programs. And so, uh, so there's a, a recent theoretical literature. Uh, so Besley and Person have an AER and an econometric paper just, just thinking about state capacity very mechanically. So you can define this either in terms of taxation as the deadweight loss of the marginal cost per dollar you raise in taxation or equivalently in expenditure terms of how much kind of wastage or leakage there is for every dollar of desired expenditure as per what the policymaker might want to do. So theoretically we kind of understand this but there's very little good empirical work that pins down the impact of investing in state capacity and that's what we're trying to do in this paper. So the most, um, so one form of state capacity, so you could think about law and law and order and judiciary as other components, but one part on the welfare side and the implementation side is a key constraint to capacity is this inability to securely transfer welfare payments to beneficiaries. So at the most basic mundane level, money for the poor just gets stolen along the way. And so you could imagine that therefore investing in a secure payments infrastructure that if effective can be seen as a form of state capacity, which can both improve the implementation of existing programs, but also expand the feasible set of what the state can do. So, um, um, so to answer the question um, uh, up front, right, is that you, know, you can think about the investment in capacity as a cost you pay today for expanding the feasible set of what you can do in the future. So this, a simple example would be replacing distortionary subsidies with direct transfers, cash transfers, which you cannot do if you don't have a way of securely getting cash to the poor. So that's another sense in which this is an investment in capacity. So, you know, so, and more broadly in the longer term, you could even think about this as a kind of public infrastructure that has spillovers to the private sector beyond what you see in government. And so the most basic example of this would be thinking about roads and railways and internet, which are all investments made by the state for its own purposes. Governments built roads and railways to get troops to the border quickly, and then these investments had massive spillovers into the private sector. Same with the internet. Um, and so in the long run, you could think about it that way. So in the Indian context, or more broadly, the idea of electronic benefits if it's transfers supported by biometric authentication has garnered huge momentum. So there's a review by CGD authors Gelbin Clark that document programs in 80 different countries. I, I, I don't know if it's 80 countries or 80 programs. I think it's one of it's 80 countries. Um, 260 programs in 80 countries. So there's a lot of kind of enthusiasm. And in India, of course, this is kind of perhaps the biggest exemplar of this, which, you know, 600 million unique IDs have been issued uh, with the former finance minister, believing that this would be a game changer for governance. So, but as usual with all kind of products, marketing is usually five steps ahead of reality, okay? Like, I mean, so while in theory this all sounds wonderful, there's many reasons to be skeptical, okay? And I think the first and most basic reason to be skeptical is just implementation complexity. 
capacity. Okay, so we're not able to deliver something as simple as getting grains to people. How do you expect that we'll put in place this very fancy implementation mechanism that can authenticate people and deliver cash? And so what we've learned from again theory and empirics is when you have very complex projects, uh, even non-performance of some components can derail the entire project. So you're only as strong as the weakest link. So you could have all this fancy build up, but if you're not able to do say cash management in the last mile, the whole project kind of fails and doesn't succeed. Okay. Um, more deeper than that is a sense that technology is kind of overhyped as a potential solution because the real problem is the deep vested interests and that these vested interests are not going to allow anti-corruption programs to be implemented properly. So, you know, like the empire will strike back, right? So you can stop this and, and you You'll have to, and there's a lot of work on that. Um, I think the, the other subtle kind of concern, in particularly in a program like Enrega, is if the local officials have to do additional work to implement these projects, corruption, though you might not like it, might be the lubricant that actually provides the incentives for these guys to do the work in the first place. So the flip side is you could cut down the corruption completely, but that could kill their incentives to implement the project, and so that could again make the poor worse off. Uh, then there's kind of much more basic concerns about exclusion errors, right? So that if you were to try and cut down corruption, what happens if genuine beneficiaries are denied? And so that's the concern that Ritika, I don't know if she's here, she said she'll come at some point, like, you know, but Ritika and Jean and others have expressed. And this is, again, a much more general problem in public economics more generally, right? That there's a trade-off between type one and type two error in implementing anti-poverty programs. So whether this is dis um, di disability insurance in the US or any other context, you, you know, you worry about fraud prevention, that there's a lot of fake beneficiaries, but the tighter you cut that, the more likely you are to deny a genuine beneficiary. So it's a much, much more general problem in public economics around the world. And then finally, there's issues of cost effectiveness, right? <laughs> because these things always kind of have cost escalations, and we really don't have any good evidence whatsoever on the effectiveness of something that's potentially transformative, potentially very ambitious, but there's just no evidence. Okay, so what are we doing in this paper? Uh, we worked with the government of Andhra Pradesh um, to randomize the rollout of biometrically authenticated EBTs via smart cards in 158 sub-districts. Okay? So it's smaller than a block. In AP, it's what's called a mandal. So a district in AP has about 40 to 50 mandals. So mandals about 30 GPs, about 70 to 75,000 people. Okay, now, in uh, the history of this project is, you know, the moment we heard about Aadhaar, I remember this conversation in Sandeep Saus in Dartmouth. He said, like, you know, this about almost five years ago, right, that this was be among the most exciting things to go and evaluate, but it became very clear very quickly that the Aadhaar is only an enabling infrastructure, that by itself it does not reduce corruption unless you integrate it with specific programs, right? So the AP Smart Card program was kind of the perfect precursor because it was integrating biometrics with the implementation of anti-poverty programs. So in some sense, it's kind of the functional precursor, though there are obviously some differences which we can talk about. Okay. Now, the other big advantage of what we did, and Santosh will concur in his comments, that this was really a minor miracle, right? I mean, because the scale of the experiment meant that this was randomized over about 19 million people at a unit of randomization that is kind of large enough to allow us to have two big advantages, right? So one is this is net of all the implementation challenges. This is not some little pilot that was done in half a district, like, I mean, with, you know, all the attention. This was the large-scale program of the state. And the second advantage, which is really in a different paper, because this, as you'll see, this paper is already too long, is one of the things we can do here is study the general equilibrium effects of better implementation of Narega. And if I have more time, which I doubt I will, I'll give you like some sneak previews of some results of that. Okay. So what do we? Uh, yeah. So is there a clock somewhere? I really would benefit from that. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes before your time, I'll be reminding you. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. So, yeah, so we've, we've done the context, and so what I'm going to do is I can skip some of these things because most of the people in this room, I assume, know what Narega is, right? It is the world's largest welfare program, uh, address, uh, you know, covering about 11% of the world's population. Um, the main point is, from an implementation perspective, uh, the payments are often late, they're often time-consuming to collect. In practice, Narega is supposed to be a demand-driven program that people get work whenever they want it. In practice, it's highly supply-constrained that, you know, people don't get the work when they want it. And so in terms of understanding the mechanisms of leakage, so Sandeep and Paul have done some 
a really nice prior work on this. There's basically three main roots of leakage. Okay? So the first are ghosts. So people who completely don't exist, but in whose name the local officials are claiming money. The second is over-reporting, which is a form of ghost, but at least in this case, the person exists. The person exists, but may or may not have done work, but you report much more work on that person's name, and you collect and pocket the difference. And the last is underpayment, where you've done 100 rupees worth of work, and I say, here's 80, take it or leave it, because I have all the power over you if I'm the local official, okay? Uh, now, similarly, there's this other program on social security pensions, which gets less attention, but is actually a really important complement to the NREGS, right? So it kind of the two stools of the welfare state in AP, because the idea is you provide income support to rural poor who cannot work, okay? So the pension program mostly targets people who are poor and widowed elderly or had, you know, belong to some... Um, displaced occupations. So the, there's very little evidence on leakage. So the evidence somehow is that people haven't heard big stories on leakage here, but there have been stories about ghosts. Essentially, people die and kind of you know stay on the rolls. So their successors continue connecting benefits of pensions for people who passed away. So there is certainly some evidence of that, but we don't. There's a lot of newspaper stories, but there's no like hard evidence quantifying that. Okay. So. Just to give you a quick sense of the picture of what used to happen, okay, this typical NREGS payment structure has the state, the district, the mandal, the gram panchayat, and the workers. Okay, so work gets recorded at the GP level, goes up to the mandal, gets digitized there, and then goes up to the state. The money then gets dispersed to district, to mandal, to GP, and then down to the worker. But notice one important thing that this GP level officials are the choke point both for the upward flow of information and for the downward flow of cash. Okay, so most of the fudging of the record like I mean happens at this level and so that's where the over reporting takes place and when the money comes down even though the money technically comes into the accounts of people when people are illiterate most of the time their passbooks are operated by the local uh, village field assistant and that's what makes it possible to siphon away the money so it's worth a 30 second aside on biometrics right I mean so there's a lot of people who are concerned about why do you really need biometrics and I think the key point is that in a world where 30 to 40 percent of people might be illiterate I mean that lets you jump over the literacy constraints of passwords and other forms of identification or other forms of authentication. So people in the US might have banks and passwords, but you know, but you don't have biometrics, but that becomes a big concern, and a lot of this leakage happens precisely because passbooks are being controlled by other people. Okay? So what does the new system do? The new system with the and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the details. But basically the idea is very simple. Okay. So the the government tendered the payment process to a bank TSP combination, where the TSP is a technology service provider, and the TSP appoints what's called a CSP or a customer service provider at the village level who does last mile cash management. Okay, so there are two things happening here. Okay, so one is that now you have separated the upward flow of information from the downward flow of money, and second thing is you've required biometric authentication over here. Okay, so the beneficiary has to authenticate biometrically, and this local CSP is then making the payment over here. Okay, now. Here's a simple picture, like I mean, of what one of these smart cards looks like. You don't always need the biometric on the card. You can sometimes have the biometric details just on the POS device. So if you look at this, so this is a typical transaction. So where the beneficiary shows up, this is the CSP sitting typically in a panchayat office or some other office in the village. That's the machine. Uh, you insert the card, uh, and then the machine is smart enough to prompt randomly to put out one finger. Okay, so it enrolls all your ten fingers up front, and then you put up a finger. You authenticate. Oops. That's you guys there. Okay. Uh Right, so you authenticate, and then after the authentication, in some cases, the machine will even announce how much money you have in your account for illiterate beneficiaries, and then you, you get paid, and then off you go. Okay, so a couple of differences relative to Aadhaar is that this is offline authentication. Okay, so Aadhaar requires continuous online authentication because you're authenticating against a central database, whereas here, the authentication is happening against the information stored in this local machine, and kind of the data sync happens at the end of every day through a GSM link, where you kind of upload the authentication logs and download the payment records that you're supposed to make okay so that's one difference but otherwise functionally it's very very similar okay um, so it's useful to kind of so overall the intervention we're evaluating it's not just biometrics okay so it's important to keep in mind that there are two things that are changing so one is the biometrics and the other is the organizational structure of how the money is being delivered so overall what we're going to present is the composite effect of both of these things but it's useful to think about the mechanisms by which each of these channels might have an impact on these different outcome measures we care about okay so if you think so this is what the changes you would get by moving the payments through the local CSP 
ISP, and this is the changes you get from the biometric authentication. Okay, so time to collect it could help because the CSPs are closer to you, but it could also delay because the biometric authentication can often, if the machine is not working, you might not get paid. Okay, so similarly with the payment delays, it could help if it's automated, but it could hurt if they mishandle the cash management. Now over reporting, so this is what's useful to understand. Okay, so the key thing that's changing in over-reporting and, uh, and, and, well, ghosts to prevent, okay, because ghosts don't have fingerprints, hopefully. Uh, but, then, uh, but with over-reporting, you see, you don't completely eliminate it. What you do is you change the bargaining power towards the beneficiary. Why? Because in the past, Metab did 10 days of work, I report he did 30 days of work. The 30 days comes in, I give him 10 and I keep the 20. Okay? Now, I could still do the same thing, except that now the money goes directly to his account and I can't touch it till he touches it. Okay? Now, I can still collude and say, I'll over-report and you kick me back a certain amount. So you've not eliminated it, but you've completely changed the bargaining power. Okay? Like, I mean, because in the past, the middleman could siphon off the money without the beneficiary even knowing about it. Okay? And what Sandeep and Paul's earlier work shows is by far the most common form of leakage is not underpayment, but over-reporting. Why? Because if it's underpayment, it's politically costly in the village, right? You have done 100 rupees work and I'm to your face telling you, here's 80, take it or leave it. In over-reporting, I steal from the very distant taxpayer, okay? So I'm not upsetting anybody in the village and everybody's happy because more money is coming into the village, okay? So this is kind of the key margin what the earlier work shows is that most of the leakage happens on the over-reporting margin, not so much on the underpayment, okay? And then program access, like I said, it could suffer if the rents are reduced. Okay, so the randomization itself, um, so we had this MOU with the government of Andhra Pradesh, and so this is again, it's one of these things which is a minor miracle, but the particular thing that made this good for evaluation is that the government of AP had followed a model of one bank, one district, okay? So they started this process back in 2006, and so, and in a way, it's a useful to comparison with Bihar and Ishakti later because Bihar had this fantastic project that Mr. Matthew had conceived, but part of the high risk of that was it was one vendor, okay? So if that one vendor had problems and didn't deliver, the project kind of went bust for the whole state. Whereas here, the government of AP had much more coordination cost because they had 23 different vendors across these different districts, but if somebody did not deliver, like I mean, they could kind of cancel the contract and reassign the contract to a bank who had delivered somewhere else. So in a way, it's exactly like telecom licensing in the 90s, right? When we had one circle, one vendor across states, over time the guys who were not very good kind of got crowded out and the good guys kind of took over market share, right? So we were at a very similar stage over here where the government had decided to re-tender the contract to eight districts, but three years after the program itself had stabilized, okay? And that's really important because if we went in with a fancy RCT at a time when the intervention was not stable, you wouldn't know what you were evaluating because the intervention would keep changing along this time, right? So the intervention itself had stabilized, but they were recontracting in these eight districts, and so we got in at just the right time to be able to sign this MOU with the government to randomize the rollout. So all we did was we staggered the mandals into three phases, into a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three, with a 24-month lag between phase one and phase three. So you know we had these 45 control and 113 mandals, and basically we worked very closely with GOAP. So our project team sat in the monthly review meetings with the government and worked worked extremely closely you know, with their MIS, and it was a fantastic working relationship. So Mr. Subramaniam, if he was here, like, you know, deserves all the credit for that, who's now uh, joint second, who's Mr. Matthew's colleague now. Okay, so this is the map of AP. Um, so some people joke, you know, that uh, now that we now that we have two states, our study has more external validity. Okay, uh, because, so uh, the, so we, you know we've got districts across the two states uh, uh, in Telangana, Coastal Andhra, and. Uh, in, and Royal Sima. And within, and you see the randomization is stratified within each district. And in fact, even within each sub-district. So any effect we're going to get is net of district fixed effects. So that's soaking up any variation in agroclimatic conditions or all of that stuff. So control and treatments are going to be similar in almost every way, right? I mean, except for receiving the program. I think I took out the balance slide, which I shouldn't have. Yeah. But yeah, there's this very, very nice kind of balance slide for those who don't do experiments. It's still kind of a bit of a miracle that the point of this entire randomization is that the treatment and controls are going to look identical on average on every single metric except for the fact that the treatment areas are going to get the biometric smart cards first and they're going to get it for two years before the control area. So that's going to be the period of our study and any estimates of the impact of these biometric smart cards therefore are cleanly attributable to just this one thing and nothing else and that's kind of the point of this entire design. 
Okay, so in terms of sampling and data collection, so the good thing again, working with the government in TCS, uh, so when Sandeep and Paul did this as grad students, they had to go and write code in the time taken to collect payments of about 25%. Uh, similar reduction in delays between working and getting paid of about 25%. Uh, reduction in the variance of the time to get paid. Actually, that's higher, right? That was 40%. I think this is an old, this is an old version. And um, the NREJS payments went up significantly by about 24%, with no increase in official disbursement. So there's also a significant reduction in leakage of the gap between the money dispersed and what beneficiaries get. So just to kind of put this in tables, right, so you see on the time to collect for NREGS, there's kind of this intention to treat a reduction of about 20 minutes on a base of 112 minutes, and the IV version of that will be about 30 minutes, okay? So it's roughly a 25% reduction. In the SSPs, you don't see an impact, okay? And this is, we're going to come back to this, and partly because for pensions, the payments were being made in the village anyway, okay? So you had this village pension disbursement officer from the government who came to the village to give you the money. So it's in fact not that surprising that you don't see the reduction in time to collect in the pensions. Uh, and the lag was not even an issue in pensions because it's got a fixed date as opposed to NRGS, so we didn't measure that. Um, but you see the significant reduction both in the payment lag. And again, for those in Ministry of Rural Development, I mean, this is probably one of the things they stress about the most. I mean, so there have been reports in the newspapers of suicides, like I mean in Maharashtra, among people who have worked and not gotten paid. So reducing the lag is one of the biggest operational concerns that people have. Now one thing here is it shows a lag of 34 days, whereas the law says 14 days. Now you shouldn't penalize AP for being open to actually giving us data. I'm sure this is much worse in other places, okay? But like, you know, just to give you some benchmark of the gap between uh, aspiration and reality, okay? So this is then the official data. And what you notice is there's actually remarkably little change in the official disbursals, okay? So uh, the highlighted periods are the periods of our surveys. So our surveys are exactly two years apart, corresponding to the peak, we, peak NREGS wage season. So obviously that's when you want to be measuring um, the work and the leakage. You don't want to do it when people are not working. So it's kind of done that way. And so then if you look at this guy, you'll see that there's no change in the official disbursement, but a significant improvement and increase in what households report getting in the surveys, so you get a significant reduction in leakage, okay? Um, in pensions, also, you get a reduction in leakage, but it's not significant and not as big, which is, again, not that surprising because, as we'll show you, the baseline levels of leakage are lower, which raises a problem, okay? So the one problem we have, have always had, as Jant will, will recall over the past three years, we've always had this problem, okay, which is that the estimated levels of leakage are negative, okay? Like, I mean, and we've been trying to make sense of what this negative level of leakage means, and the answer turns out to be the following, okay, which is that we sample on the basis of the job card, okay, but the households often have multiple job cards. So the household reports the amount earned on multiple job cards, whereas we are sampling a subset of that, okay. So when you then use the NSS data to come up with the right inflation factor for the average number of job cards per household, what you get are much more sensible numbers, which is a leakage level of 30% in the control areas and a reduction of about 10.8 percentage points in the treatment areas, okay. But because of the scale that's kind of slightly insignificant, okay? But remember, this doesn't change the fact that there is a significant reduction in leakage, okay? You only need this to then come back and quantify the gains. And similarly with pensions, you see the baseline leakage was kind of low at about 8%, but you get a 3.2 percentage point reduction, which is almost a 40% reduction in the leakage rates in the pension program. Okay, so now what's interesting here is if, uh, if we had a 90 minute seminar, I would spend much more time on this, but it's useful to kind of think a little bit about the mechanisms of impact, okay? So we look at the ghosts, and in fact, you find absolutely no impact on the ghosts. So about this 11% ghosts. So ghost is a household that's defined as in our official data, they have been paid, and the survey team goes there. There's no trace of that household. We talk to three neighbors, and people say this house has never existed, okay? So about 11% of the benefits are going to households that are complete ghosts. Okay, that we have no idea who they are, we can never find them. And there's no impact on the ghosts, which is not surprising because you only got 50% coverage, right? So the remaining 50% is still completely able to kind of drive a truck through this hole, okay, that still remains. Now, similarly, like, I mean, on the underpayment, which is kind of proxied by did you have to pay a bribe to collect your payment, we don't find much impact because, again, the baseline levels of this problem is very low. Only about 2% of households report this. So where is the action? Okay, the action is all coming from this reduction in over-reporting, okay, reduction in other over-reporting. And in particular, I'll show you these non-parametric graphs where you see the biggest reduction is in households in whose name money has been claimed but who have not received a penny, 
Okay? So these are real households, but now in the past money could be siphoned off in their name, but now you cannot siphon off money in the name of this real household because the real household has to show up with a fingerprint. And so that is where you're seeing the biggest reduction in leakage. Okay? So if we had more time, we can talk more about this, but that's kind of the main story. So you know, if you get to 100% coverage, you will probably plug this element of leakage as well. But I'll save this point for the discussion that the, if you plug leakage all the way, then the vested interests fight back much more. Okay? So in a way, maybe the government of AP got this calibration exactly right. Okay? Like, I mean, that they pushed to reduce leakage bit by bit, but they didn't try to go 100% because then you'd get all these vested interests coming back and fighting at you. Okay? So we'll come back to that in discussion, but that's useful. Now, so this is then the amazing result, okay, which in a way was the biggest puzzle because you, you know, one of the things we had, we worried about was if you reduce corruption, will access to work go down, okay? But in fact, you get a significant increase in access. You get almost a 18 to 20% increase in the fraction of households that have worked on NREGS. But you can see why that happened because all of this is coming on this over-reporting margin, right, of households who in the past, in their name, I was siphoning off money. Now I actually have to give them work. I still make some money on it, but I have to give them the work because you can't collect the money without those fingerprints. Okay, so we'll, um, and the most kind of uh, sensible explanation of this is people are still making enough money in NREGS for this to be worth their time. Okay, but it's not as much as before. Okay, so that's kind of why you're seeing this increase in access. So finally, uh, so how am I? <laughs> right? So mm, that works. <laughs> yeah, I started at four no, ten. Now right? it's the real part. Now it's the real part. Perfect. So heterogeneity, okay, like so one of the concerns in all of this work is that the average impacts might be positive, but the distributional effects could be undesirable if the poorest and most vulnerable households are worse off. Okay. So what we we're doing this in three ways. I'm going to show you what are called quantile treatment effects, okay? And the main point to take from this statistically is that the treatment outcome first order stochastically dominates the controls, which means nobody in a treatment household is worse off than a corresponding household at the same percentile in the control control distribution okay, on all the key outcomes. And then you see, look at this. This is the official payment where there's absolutely no change. Okay? Whereas this is too faint to see, but you'll see there's a significant reduction in the households who don't get paid anything. Okay, so this is where these, there's a bunch of these households in whose name money was being taken, but who now have to be paid because they need to show up with their fingerprints, I mean, to go collect the money. Okay? So, there's not much heterogeneity by baseline characteristics. And the final thing, which kind of gets at this business of the mechanism. So of course this is non-experimental, like, you know, but rather than look for an instrument for implementation, which is really not very credible, we just think given the sample size, it's just much more credible to just do a non-experimental decomposition. So what we're doing here is we're looking at these main effects. Okay, so look at time to collect. So the good news, if you see, is we are breaking this non-experimentally into carded GPs and uncarded GPs. So remember I told you the implementation was only about 50%, right? So even in terms of the converted GPs that had converted to the new system, only about two-thirds of the gram panchayats had converted to the new system. About one-third was still in the old system. And then within the converted GPs, only about 60% of beneficiaries had in fact started using the smart cards. The other 40% had not gotten the cards. Okay? And they didn't get the cards mainly because they missed the enrollment camp. Because enrollment happens in this big camp mode, like in whom people go. And like if you miss that camp, then you're out of luck. Okay? So what is so this decomposition is basically showing you the difference between carded GPs and uncarded GPs. And you know, it's very assuring to see that all the impact is in the carded GPs, okay, which is what you would expect if this was in fact the mechanism. But then what's interesting is within carded GPs, we can break this down into having a smart card and not having a smart card. And you see that there's in fact no difference that within the village, once the village has shifted to the new payment system, it actually doesn't matter that you don't have the card. And that's because the way the government had set it up was they couldn't deny payments if you didn't have a card, right? So you could still come up with your pay slip and your wage slip and still come to the CSP and collect your money. So all the benefits and time saving happens as long as your village is converted, even if you don't have the card. But all the benefits in leakage, if you now look at this guy, the leakage benefits happen only if you, in fact, have the biometric smart card. Okay? So the reduction in leakage is completely unaffected if you were somebody who did not get the card. So in terms of these two components of what happened, you move the payment closer to the beneficiary with the CSP, and so that has helped time to collect and the operations, but the biometric was the key to reducing the leakage. Okay? So amazingly, I'm almost done.
Right? And then we've got kind of the welfare and cost effectiveness. So, I mean, from policy impact, this was probably like, you know, back in my consulting life, we used to have this term called the million dollar slide, but we've had too much inflation, so now we need a billion dollar slide. But this is kind of the billion dollar slide, which is when we met with the chief secretary afterwards, after this result, what is amazing is that 87% of beneficiaries strongly prefer the new smart card system for NREGA, and 92% under their pensions. Now, notice the beneficiaries are quite sophisticated. Okay, they're not just blindly saying this is a great system. Okay, they say about 70% say it increases the speed of collecting money that nobody else can collect the payment. They have to make fewer trips, but they're also concerned. They say like, you know, I'm concerned that I will lose my card and not get the money. I'm concerned that the payment reader will not work. Okay, now the reason this is important is the political economy of the protests. Okay, so when we were in the government, they had been getting a lot of negative feedback from the field saying that you're inconveniencing beneficiaries. But this is a classic case of concentrated costs and diffuse gains, right? So the guys who are losing, the middlemen who are losing, are the ones who are going to make the most noise, whereas the gains are highly diffuse, and so they're not going to come and scream and saying, this is a great program, don't scrap it, okay? But the guys who are losing are not going to come and say, scrap the program because I'm not making money. They're going to come and say, scrap the program because don't inconvenience this poor beneficiary, okay? So we were part of this entire political economy in the government, every monthly review meeting, right? I mean, and in the end, the data we were providing was then the one that helped the secretary because apparently the CM wanted to cancel the program for pensions and chief secretary then took this number took these numbers and they actually rescinded that order to continue continue using the system so the final piece is cost effectiveness is so the government paid 2% of all converted payments as the commission in an all inclusive basis okay so this included the cost of the enrollment the cost of cash management the cost of keeping the system going and what you see is there are three there are two main categories of benefits the first are the straight improvements in efficiency okay which is reduction in time and reduction in variance so this is a pure efficiency gain from an economist perspective so uh, uh, dilip and nirvikar will remember from the discussion on corruption is that reducing corruption is actually just redistribution, okay? That you're taking money away from the corrupt middleman and giving to the beneficiary. So from a welfare perspective, it's hard to sign that unless you can calculate the distortions. But all we can say is that the program implementation was intended to go to the poor and not to the corrupt beneficiary. So at least in, in order, it should be welfare improving. Okay? Uh, but the magnitude of this leakage reduction, so just to look at the numbers, what we see is that the efficiency gain from time savings alone covers the entire cost of the program for NREGS. Okay? And the leakage reduction we calculate is about eight times the cost of the program. Okay? So that's it. And so the summary is basically that the smart cards appeared cost effective under real world conditions. And so I think the most important lesson we take away from this was that implementation was incomplete. It was only 50%, okay? But at such low levels of governance, at such low levels of state capacity, that any improvement, like even at 50% implementation, gave you a significant improvement I mean, in program performance. Uh, the improvements are spread across the distribution and practically everyone prefers the smart cards to the old system. Um, and you know, the cost, uh, the cost savings were big and there was no negative extensive margin effect. So in most ways we think that our estimates are a lower bound on the benefits because we're calculating benefits from just two public programs and not looking at potential improvements in a whole range of other programs, whether it's PDS or scholarships or stuff like that. And then we're not counting any of the long-term private sector benefits that might happen from building this kind of payments infrastructure. Okay, so let me stop there. And then, yeah, so like I said, investment in state capacity may have these large returns. So I do have a slide for discussion, but which maybe I'll save after Mr. Matthews' discussion because a lot of this are political economy questions about why did the interest, vested interest not scuttle the program? Like, and since Mr. Matthews tried to implement the same thing in Bihar, uh, we'd have hopefully like a very enlightening conversation in the political economy of making these things happen. And I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> that leaves us with a lot of thought on where to go from here. But first, I'll, let me ask Santosh to kick off the first part of the discussion. I think I should start by congratulating both the authors and my colleague and dear friend, Reddy Subramani, for pulling this off. In, a, in, 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 in today's administrative context, doing an RCT of this scale is like holding your breath while you wait for the X-ray technician to take your chest X-ray. <laughs> I just hope he gets it right. So you guys got it right. 
it's i mean in standing in front to comment on this paper is really poignant for me for a number of reasons it's because i tried the same thing in bihar and i couldn't pull it off uh, reddy subramani my colleague we studied in the same town in chennai he was in mcc i was in lehla uh, we studied in the same city he was in jnu i was in d school we joined the ias in the same batch he went to andhra and i went to bihar we tried to do this i couldn't he did <laughs> and here now i'm commenting on his work um karthik said ghosts have no biometrics have no fingerprints but karthik they do <laughs> especially if the biometrics is non duplicated in fact i'm really surprised by the result and i don't think the result will last the reason being biometrics doesn't solve many problems because it's very easy because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes i actually run a program on skilling and placement and i have evidence that actually 10 fingers are used by of the same person is actually used to mark attendance for 10 people so unless this speaks to a deduplicated national database which only aadhar can give you this is bound to fail is my administrator's insight or lack of it to this uh, to this experiment but having said that what's what's been achieved is truly remarkable it's also remarkable for another reason and it's remarkable because you had one bank one district so what you're setting up for is again another monopoly and place for rents to be harvested in fact this entire pos based payment system according to me will never work pos meaning point of sale it's like your credit card authentication thing just that you have a biometric and then you use that to speak back into an accounting mechanism then you are able to see how much is payable or how much is available and you make that payment according to me can only work when you have like an urban user of an atm machine you can go to any bank and take your money out of that machine but the, we are actually today uh, uh, rbi has taken a policy decision to make that happen but in the absence of that you are actually condemning rural poor to the uh, uh, way, uh, to 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 uh, another exploitative system and uh, wherein they are going to face demands for rent from people who are going to provide it's been our experience in other parts of the country and i'm sure over time this will happen here as well so again for another reason it's truly remarkable that andhra pradesh has been able to achieve uh, what it has uh i have no quarrel with your uh, with your estimation strategy and with your results uh, uh, i am in broad agreement not just broad agreement uh, i am fully in agreement i just would like to spend a few minutes contemplating or thinking aloud as to why this was possible in andhra and uh, uh, in this particular case it's been my case and my own research in fact is uh, is titled state incapacity by design that's the matthew more paper he was referring to it's my own thesis that a lot of the state incapacity incapacity that you see that you see today is actually driven by <laughs> political incentives and i'm speaking to my own experience as to why we were trying to implement the e shakti program in bihar and we found it exceedingly difficult to actually pull it off of course there were design issues there but i believe there were also political economy questions behind it and what is the political economy question i leave that thought for you to discuss those of us who know the the administration or the political uh, system in andhra pradesh are very well aware that in andhra pradesh you have a system by which the political leadership has over the last decade or so separated the implementation of anti poverty interventions from other interventions that are more related to infrastructure large irrigation and so on and so forth on the one hand you know that you know politics is an expensive business let's not fool anybody money needs to be spent on elections so the political economy in fact if you don't the electorate doesn't take you seriously so in andhra pradesh it's my own understanding that there is a there is headroom available for the political class to allow interventions like this to actually happen because the surplus that has to be brought in to be able to fight electoral battles can be taken away can be uh, uh, 
uh, accessed or harnessed without affecting our anti-poverty programs. But this is a luxury that many poor states of India do not have. And I believe that there is something to be uh, uh, said about uh, uh, this uh, uh, in the way uh, uh, poor pro uh, uh, anti-poverty programs tend to fail in, in the poor parts of India. Let me just take you to own, my own case of Bihar. The, the uh, almost 15-year regime when uh, either his, uh, uh, directly by himself, when Mr. Lalu Prasad was the chief minister or through his family, it was a period when Bihar was discussed as an era when state was... Well, you, you, you said it, I didn't. <laughs> he said the word withered away, I'm quoting him. <laughs> well, there was a problem of governance. But despite that problem of governance or low state capacity, there were actually islands of tremendous state capacity which showed itself. And some examples of this were, one, the, 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 the cooperative system. I was registrar of cooperative societies. There was a systematic attack on primary PACs, the primary agricultural credit societies. There's a systematic attack to actually uh, 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 finish them off. It's natural because you had a new political leadership that came which, was, which had as its mandate to work against the landed interests. Yet, there's one class of cooperatives that did exceedingly well. Does anybody want to take a guess? It's the milk cooperative societies. Because the Yadavs were milkmen. <laughs> there is another case of total police failure. It was the kidnapping capital of the world, crime was increasing, and there was a political logic around that increase in crime. I will not hold forth on uh, about this here, but there was again an island of tremendous capacity of the police force with respect to law and order. And what was that? We had almost a right-free, communal right-free period during that time. So the same police force which could not stop your kidnapping and theft and all other kinds of violence was very successful in stopping communal right. So the point I'm making is that while we are uh, uh, you know, happy about uh, uh, the results that you have. Uh, we also need to stand back and, and, and sort of ponder about the, the, the political economy implications of why this works where it works. And, and, and it's only when we have, I mean, just look at the astounding numbers. Just look at these numbers. Uh, I had it open here. It's $38 million, Karthik? Yeah. Huh? 30, and you spend how much? They spend $4 million? The so $4 million spent, value of time saved, $4 million. So you've actually made your money back on, times, on time saved of poor people. It's perhaps that the time saved, saved for poor people have no value in our, our system. But even if it is hard cash, uh, you have uh, 38, in, in terms of reduced leakages, you have 30.8 30 million dollars saved. I mean, this is, I mean, if the economics doesn't, I mean, if the starkness of these numbers doesn't speak to you, we need to ask the question that why are we struggling to make those additional investments that are required to make some of our programs work? They're just questions I have and again, thank you very much, Karthik uh, and your team for making this happen. Thank you very much, Santosh. <laughs> the insightful comments on the interlinkages of poverty programs and the political economy. May I now request Mr. Janet Sinha? To make his comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm indeed uh, honored and privileged to be here with you all to talk about uh, I think two uh, very pioneering papers. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have worked uh, with Karthik and Sandeep over the last three years as they've uh, done what I think is probably one of the most amazing social science experiments ever done in the history of humanity because you are doing an RCT with 19 million people. Uh, as the underlying population. I think somewhere in some academic 
roll of honor, their names shall forever be etched. <laughs> of course, when you're etching Karthik's name, you have to also etch him in kind of the speed at which he speaks. But <laughs> as you can see, the extraordinary amount of work he's done, even in the 40 minutes at his rate, he still can't cover all of it. So I would urge you all to grab him somewhere and spend five hours with him. Maybe then you'll get a sense of why this is, this is such an extraordinary project, which of course it is. All that being said, I think we have to ask some very basic, simple questions. The basic question is, why doesn't the Indian state perform better? I mean, at one very simple level, one would say that something like biometric authentication, a technology-based system to provide benefits is obvious. Why wouldn't you know, my distinguished colleagues here from the Admin Indian Administrative Service just jump on it and get it done? Why not? Why doesn't it happen? And we can sit here in an academic way and talk about it. But I think we have to ask ourselves some very practical questions. And if you know, I have traveled a certain journey in my life, it's because I've asked those practical questions. And I'm here because I'm trying to answer them in some way. Uh, you know, I'm the son of an IAS officer, and I've grown up in that milieu. Uh, so I have an understanding of what uh, district administration and, and government administration is like. Uh, obviously, I've been a business person and an investor for most of my life, but I've also because uh, uh, of my father, who's, uh, who's been in politics now for 30 years, had a chance to see firsthand what politics is like. And I've always asked myself this question, which is, why is it that the Indian state doesn't work better? And again, as I said, we can come up with long academic explanations. But uh, at the heart of it, I think we have to ask some very simple questions uh, about capacity and intent. This is an easy question. I'm sure all of you will know this. How many districts are there in India? 600. 626. How big is a district? But 2 million people will roughly be. How many IAS officers are there in a district? 2, 3, 4, somewhere. I mean, full time equivalent. Sometimes half. There are 4,500 IAS officers. You know, this is, this is a very interesting question. I often ask people how many people do you think there are in the IAS? People say, oh, 50,000, maybe 100,000. How many people do you, get, do you think get in every year? Oh, 10,000. <laughs> people have no idea how limited the capacity of the Indian state actually is. So we have very, very few IAS officers in a district of 2 million people. Then we have the PCS people, who obviously are not as competent and as well-educated and trained as they are. How long do you think an IAS officer stays in a district? On average, how many? Uh, sorry, I think um, less than five thousand. Less than five thousand in the country. Yes, sir. in the country, four thousand five. So I, you know, we're having a long ap academic discussion. We are going through some, you know, very, uh, you know, extraordinary analyses, statistics. But as you all think, why are you here? Why are we all here? We want the Indian state to do better, but we have to understand what the ground realities are. How big is India? It's 1.25 billion people. How many IAS officers do we have? And what do you think the vacancies are in district administration? I can tell you in my state, because obviously I monitor it closely, whether you talk about the district education officer, the civil servant, PCS officers, teachers, nurses. In Jharkhand, I can tell you the vacancy rate is 50%. So you already have a state that is well below the numbers that it should be in terms of capacity. And on top of that, the vacancy rate is 50%. I'm sure in a well-governed state like Andhra Pradesh or Tamil Nadu, it's not as high. But I'm sure it's still 20 or 30%. So we have too few people, and most of those posts are vacant. Right? And people stay in their posts for 16 months on average, or 18 months to 24 months. Every time people want to move their people around, they'll shift the SP, they'll shift the DC. <coughs> What continuity do we have in terms of getting any of these programs done? Now, when I go and I speak to my district collectors and I speak to government officials in the districts, and I say, well, why haven't you got this done? Do you know how many schemes there are from the government of India, central government schemes? You can 66. tell. 66. Each scheme has to be reported back from the district administration to the center. Then there are, I'm sure, another 20 or 30 schemes per state. So you have an undermanned ill-equipped, overworked staff with many absences drowning in a sea of paperwork. And then we say, well, it's a flailing state. It sounds good at the Kennedy School. 
but I'm telling you, come, you come to Tati Jhadiya block in Hazari Bagh, and I'll tell you what it's like. It's not a flaming state, it's a, it's a state that doesn't exist. There's no presence on the ground. And whatever little there is, is drowning in a sea of paperwork. So let's just put things in context, folks. So when we say, well, let's put in place this you know, fancy biometrically based system and change people's lives, we, and let's figure out, you know, is it 20% difference, 10% difference? I'm throwing up my hands and telling you all, there's nothing there. What are we going to do? How do we do any of this? Right? This is this, these are the fundamental challenges that you're dealing with. Now, then we have to talk about, you know, this is the capacity part that I was talking about. Now let's talk about the intent. What is the role of the Indian state? At, at, some, at some level one has to say that, you know, we have the facade of a Danish welfare state. We talk about a welfare, Danish, you know, progressive European style welfare state. And, as you were saying, you know, at the center there are all these wonderful 66 schemes, we'll do this, we'll do that. The finance minister announced a whole set of schemes as well, which I defended in parliament yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the intent, you know, we want to do all these wonderful things. Uh, but at the same time, and I, I, I must, uh, you know, commend uh, the Why Nations Fail book about bringing up this uh, label. Do we have genuinely in Tati Jhadiya block a Danish welfare state, or do we have a predatory state? And we have to ask ourselves, what is the tradition and the history of the Indian state in the first place? I don't think the British imperialists were running much of a welfare state, nor were the Mughals running a welfare state. What kind of state were they actually running? What is the history and tradition of the Indian state as such? It's not a Danish welfare state. So fine, you know, in 1947 to 1950 period when we had the constituent assembly and they drafted you know, a very well-meaning, well-intentioned constitution and I'm reminded of that history when I'm in parliament. But I'm reminded of what we actually have on the ground when I go back to my constituency and I see the state in action. So we've got the worst of both worlds. We've got the facade of a Danish welfare state, a progressive European welfare state and all of the, 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 the uh, sort of well-intentioned uh, objectives around that. But on the ground, we have a predatory state because, by and large, most of these overworked, underpaid, uh, harried government officials are just trying to make their, you know, make their living a little bit better, make ends meet, and they're prepared to do all kinds of things that you and I would feel quite offended and, and, and feel that they're doing in a very corrupt and exploitative way. But as for them, they have reached a point of amorality, in my own view, where they don't even see it as right and wrong. They'll sell teacher's posts, they'll sell a driver's posts, they'll take 10, 20, 50 percent uh, commission on any project that gets done. That is the reality. So on the one hand, we have a state. We have a state that has very limited capacity and a state that's not genuinely working on behalf of the people. And then, you know, overburdened with all of these schemes and everything else. And then we ask ourselves, well, why don't we do this as well? And those are the central challenges. So I think even as we do this kind of work and think about what are the kinds of programs that we need to put in place, we also need to ask ourselves, what type of state do we really have? And I'll use an American expression, are we just putting lipstick on a pig when we try to do these kinds of schemes? Or are we better off? Are we better off really rethinking the nature of the Indian state and asking ourselves some very fundamental questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sina. I think that was an absolutely candid introspection on where we all are and what we're all about. Santosh, I think you had something yeah, I, to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, Karthik, I forgot the main point I wanted to make. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I hope you recover from this. <laughs> now, look at this. I don't know how, how many of you... Have you seen this? Have you seen the paper? Okay. Now... The left side has status quo. Look at the number of levels through which money has to go before it can reach the, not the worker, but the Gram Panchayat. Those of you who have operated government systems know that when money is given out, money is also taken in, which means there's normally a percentage cut that is taken when money is given out. Now, I am just wondering whether the efficiency gains you've had in the card experiment was because of the reduction of layers and not because of the introduction of the card. 
Now let me say something more. Along with Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, Rohini Pandey and Clement, we worked on a RCT in Bihar to actually test the efficacy of a non-carded experiment, which you know run into all sorts of problems, because there our assumption was that by removing these layers, actually the rationing would come down, because we have almost 60-70% rationing in Bihar, despite being one of the poorest parts of the country which needs so much more Narega, our utilization of Narega funds are so low. So we did an RCT on that. And what we found that, what we found was, by removing these layers, our expenditure didn't go up. It actually went down. But we got another astonishing result. And that was corruption actually came down. So we did a survey of over 10,000 households and we found that despite spending less money, the amount of money that households were getting actually had not gone down. So, so it's really a big question here as to is the result that we are seeing from this experiment because of the carding or because of the reduction of layers? Thank you. A very interesting thought, Santosh. Uh, in fact, that is at the root of a lot of uh, anti-poverty programs. We, those 66 schemes that I mentioned earlier, just a factual, Government of India transfers almost Three, four lakh crore rupees every year under plan to the states. And almost 60% of that is only for about 17 big programs, which cater to one of them, the biggest of them all being uh, the Narega, which we are discussing today. But the, there are all these small schemes for which, which accounts for another 40% of the transfer. But the real issue is that the pipeline or the arteries from New Delhi, Krishi Bhavan, if you must, to the block that Mr. Sinha talked about are completely blocked. It takes money moves slowly, if at all, because we are so process driven and we are so answerable for the return reporting that the money was well spent. We'll, I'll throw this floor open for discussion for 10 minutes. Thank you.